Newly re-elected Representative Duncan Hunter back in court on Monday. A trial date for the indicted congressman is set for next September. What happens if he's found guilty? Also in political news, San Diego City Councilman David Alvarez is termed out after eight years of serving communities from Barrio Logan to San Ysidro. Now he wants to turn attention to the border. And San Diego's cruise ship industry is booming again. We'll talk about what's behind this surge. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. Joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, Lori Weisberger covers tourism and hospitality for the San Diego Union Tribune. KPBS investigative reporter Claire Tregesser, and also from KPBS News, reporter Priya Shreether. Well, Congressman Duncan Hunter hung on to his seat in last month's election. The Republican beat out Democratic challenger Amar Kampanajar by less than four points. Even a felony indictment stretching 47 pages alleging gross misuse of campaign funds wasn't enough to sink Hunter in this deep red district. But what now? So Priya, back in court this week, start there, what happened? So essentially the purpose of this court date was to set a trial date and we now know that trial date is going to be September 10th, 2019. So the prosecutors and the defense attorneys had to negotiate a little bit, but it's going to be about a year away. And why this long lag time? That's a great question. Uh, the judge actually acknowledged that it is quite a long time from the initial indictment, which uh, happened back in August, but he said he had to weigh the fact that the federal prosecutors had a lot of evidence and to let the discovery process happen, let the defense lawyers sift through all of that, but also keep in mind the public's right to a fair and speedy trial. Okay, a lot of questions here with this uh, whole situation. Hunter goes back to Washington, he starts another term with a new Congress. So what's that gonna be like? Is he gonna, the Democrats obviously in the majority now, is he gonna be exiled? Is he gonna serve on committees? Uh, you had the GOP speaker, Paul Ryan, and the Congress that's winding down now, he kind of booted him committee work after his indictment. Right. But. Initially, Duncan Hunter didn't want to step down from those three committees that he was serving on. But after Paul Ryan kind of pressured him, he finally uh, said, OK, fine, put his hands up in the air. And now he's um, off of those committees. So he can still serve. And we have to keep in mind here that he did just win uh, this election against Amar Kampanajar. So obviously, uh, the people of the 50th district want him to represent them. So he can still uh, serve as a congressman. He can still vote. Um, there are he can essentially do everything he was doing before. And even if he is convicted after this trial, um, there are no rules that he actually has to step down, which is quite fascinating. I was uh, talking to a source earlier this week, and as I understand it, under federal rules and, and law, he can actually use campaign funds for his legal defense uh, fund. And a lot of people are wondering, you know, why he even decided to run when he's going through all of this. But one of the reasons that some analysts are speculating is that he actually needs the money to pay for those legal fees. So mm -hmm. that could be one reason that he's deciding to prolong this. To raise the funds. Is there, is there a sense that he might wait until, you know, January or February and then step down so that there would be a special election? I mean, what's interesting about this is, I mean, he seems to keep denying that he did anything wrong. You know, we've seen him react to this in several different ways. One was uh, saying that his wife was the person who actually, you know, misused the campaign funds. Then he said, you know, leave my wife out of it. She had nothing to do with it. But he's maintained his innocence. And, you know, a lot of people say, why would he put himself through another campaign if he was just going to step down? So as of right now, most of the analysts that I have spoken to don't seem to think that's going to be the case. They think he's really going to wait for this to play out. And now that we do have the trial date, we're federal prosecutors are saying that this trial is going to take at least three weeks. So we're not even going to see a verdict in this case until about October of next year. If it goes off on time. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And there could be delays. And then, so then if you have, we might as well get into that now right. here and we'll backtrack a little on the indictment itself. But then you have uh, a waiting period. I mean, if the Congress expels him at that point or at some point their special election does come up, this mm -hmm. maybe as part of a plea deal, he steps down, who knows. 
Um, you have a waiting period, then what, a primary, a special election. Now we're up to the primary in 2020 in California, which right. is in the spring of that year. And that's why the fact that this is happening in the fall of next year is so interesting because, you know, we could get a verdict as early as October of 2019, but then it could be several more weeks until there's a potential senten sentencing if he is in fact convicted. And as we know, special elections take a lot of money. Uh, they take a lot of time, usually several months. So then we're looking at if a special election is called and there is a vote and he is expelled from Congress, that would take us to the spring of 2020, which is when a primary would be happening anyway, anyway yeah. for his seat. So a lot of people say, listen, you know, Democrats don't really do well in special elections. Historically, there's a low voter turnout in special elections. So it might actually make more sense for Democrats to let Duncan Hunter go through his entire two year term um, instead of trying to kick him out and have a special election if delay he is in fact convicted. It, delay it and go there. Um, I, uh, Laura? Uh, yeah, I was just, I was just kind of piggybacking on this whole protracted timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, given the expense of, of a trial, and y y you're saying he wants to see it played out, but those bills will keep mounting and, you know, there'll be discovery and depositions and that is all very costly. Do you think maybe there's some line of thinking that as this plays out, and they see what they have more on what they have against him that they're this gives them room to settle and 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 somehow yeah. get out gracefully you know actually in the press box at that court hearing um, there was a lot of speculation just based on body language that perhaps they had already reached a settlement and so then when that didn't happen that was kind of interesting but now we have a long time for the defense attorneys to look through all that um, evidence in the discovery process and people are still saying there's still time here for yeah a settlement to perhaps take place and maybe he doesn't want to you know have this drag all out and I mean as you can see there's been a media circus surrounding this this whole trial let's talk for a minute review that indictment a little bit and as I said it was 47 pages we won't review right. the whole thing but um, how much in campaign funds were alleged to be has misused by Hunter and his wife? We should note she's under indictment as well. What were some of the more egregious expenses? Wow, that? okay, where to begin? $250,000 is what's being alleged here as far as uh, misuse of campaign funds. And he's being charged, him and his wife, because she was uh, serving as his campaign manager, are being charged with 60 felony uh, counts of wire fraud, falsifying records, campaign finance uh, violations and conspiracy. Now, some of those things were uh, trips to Italy, Hawaii, a family vacation to Las Vegas. I should mention a $600 ticket to pay for a family rabbit to go on an airplane. The 13, family rabbit. The, yeah, the, the family <laughs> rabbit. We have to bring that one up. $1,300 in video games, um, also pay payments to his son's school, an oral surgeon. I mean, the list goes on. Um, fine dining, tequila shots. I mean, you name it. It's like out of a Hollywood script almost. And, and you mentioned earlier that initially he had, and he caught a lot of flack for trying to throw his wife under the bus, saying she right. was in charge of all these expenses and all. But when you read this indictment, and, and sources confirm firm, there are several numbered individuals in here. And one pops out, for example, a long ski weekend in Lake Tahoe here yes. with an individual 14. Right. And it's it's clear the allegation there is that this is a mistress. Are we to believe his wife has paid for a ski trip? All right. Well, like I said, he's kind of been all over the map in how he's responded to these allegations. You know, one minute we see he's saying that, you know, uh, she was in charge of the money. And when he was in the military, she was in charge of all his money then. And that kind of continued in her role as campaign manager. And then the next minute you see him saying, hey, this is a witch hunt. This has all been politically motivated. Leave my wife out of it. But yes, as you mentioned, individuals 14 through 18, which were listed in the indictment, he was allegedly having personal relationships with and spending some of his campaign money on taking them to fancy dates in Tahoe and on road trips and shopping excursions. All right, a few seconds left. Last question in this segment. Um, at, at this time, when, when uh, his wife was working for him in the office there in Washington, plus his own uh, salary as a congressman, what were they making together here in, in terms of uh, about two hundred thousand dollars a year and that's what's fascinating because we're also hearing all these reports of him over withdrawing his bank accounts so clearly there was definitely some issues as far as money management between the two of them right I, I note the indictment talks about uh, uh, thirty eight thousand dollars nearly spent bank, fee bank fees and overdrafts for in insufficient funds well right. fascinating and obviously big follow-up stories there as this thing plays out through the next year we're gonna move on 
For eight years, David Alvarez has represented a city council district that sprawls from San Ysidro to Barrio Logan. He ran for mayor and lost. Last month, he ran for the board of San Diego County Community College District and lost. Now he's termed out as a San Diego uh, city councilman, and Alvarez is reflecting on his two terms and looking ahead. And Claire, start with, uh, with Alvarez now. Um, how did he characterize the workings of the council during his long exit interview? And we'll, we'll hear from him too in a minute on that. Yeah, uh, well, he said that it, it has varied over the years depending on who was on the council. There was a brief period where Democrats had a six to three veto proof majority, but he said no matter what throughout it all, he felt like the council hadn't really found its voice and hadn't figured out how to be a strong counterbalance to the strong mayor form of government. He called it go along to get along, that there's a lot of votes that just go in favor of um, whatever the mayor wants to do and that they hadn't figured out how to take their own stands and get their own policies pushed through. And, and in your interview, he uh, seemed a little uh, frustrated at times, relationships eroding and all, and we've got a, a bite from him on that. Let's hear that. A lot has changed in terms of how people treat each other. Um, a lot of respect has been lost in when you disagree. There has been a lot of um, behavior that we wouldn't think is okay of our children in a school, on school ground, uh, backstabbing and bullying. And um, I'm not saying I was a victim to that, but I certainly don't ever want to be associated with that. Well, not happy about the collegiality <laughs> of all yeah. of that. I mean, I think part of that was that he wanted to be the council president and wasn't successful in his efforts to do that. Um, and now he's run for the uh, community college board and lost there and didn't get the support of the local Democratic Party. So I think he's got some sour grapes going on. Um, yeah. Lori? Well, you know, I was reading the interview um, that you had with him, and throughout there's this constant theme that um, that the council members haven't listed, listened enough to their communities, and the incumbents who lost, that's a big reason why they lost, whereas he's always listening to his communities, and then that was kind of his strong point. So going to that community college district, I realize it's a whole different kind of an election, but if he's seen as a politician who really cares about his constituents, I'm wondering why, why wasn't he able to make it work there? Here's a guy that ran for mayor and he, and he couldn't even make it onto the community college district board. Um, and given his sensibilities, why, why didn't that resonate with those voters? Yeah, well, my understanding, I didn't cover that race, but uh, his competitor, I think, did a really strong ground game and just did a lot of work um, reaching out to people. Um, David Alvarez, I think, knows how to reach people in his district, and he showed that by, you know, his staffer who he supported, Vivian Moreno, ended up winning uh, the election for his seat against the support, the Labor Council and the Democratic Party were supporting her opponent, and she still came in with a pretty strong showing. So I think, you know, he knows how to reach people in his district, but maybe in a larger citywide election, you know, he doesn't know how to... Uh, or he chooses not to connect with the bigger power players that maybe you need to for, for those types of elections. So we heard from um, the councilman on um, his feelings about the collegiality on yeah. the <laughs> council itself. What about changes in the electorate and about how, what people want now from city council? It kind of gets to what Laurie was saying about, uh, you know, um, what, what people want and, and listening, right. being well, listened to in the Right, well, he was talking a lot about I mean, in this past election, there were two incumbents right. who lost re-election. Um, Myrtle Cole lost in her district and Lori Zapp lost in her district. There's probably different reasons maybe in, in both of those races, but Dave Alvarez was saying, well, if I were still on the council, I would see that as a strong sign and a wake-up call of, you know, if you're a council member, you need to be about serving your district meeting with people in your district, figuring it out what it is that they want, not getting so wrapped up in the bigger city politics. He talked about that it's like very insular once you're elected, you're just in that building, you're talking to all the same people, 
and you need to remember to listen to people who live in the place. City that, staff is giving a lot of information right, and feedback right. and maybe not the people in your district. Lori, it occurs to me, you, you saw that with uh, council members on this uh, Airbnb fight here on, on your beat there where it's hard to listen there because you have different factions and a very contentious issue in that district. And of course you've got competing factions. I guess that's what leadership's all about in, in the end. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, Alvarez, you asked him uh, what he thought his biggest accomplish, uh, accomplishments were uh, during the eight years? Yeah, I mean, for that, he said, you know, it's like choosing your favorite child or something. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, he didn't point to some big monstrous project. Right, yeah. well, he had he had a long list of everything from, you know, a new library to helping a woman get a broken street light repaired on her street. And he said, you know, as a true politician, he said, all of those things are equally as gratifying, like I'm happy about the big projects as I am about a really small success helping you know one person with an issue that, that she's having. And the other side of that question, biggest regrets? Yeah, th that one he gave a pretty specific answer, which is just housing. <clears throat> um, he said that he feels like the council hasn't done enough to create affordable housing. He has young kids. I think anyone with kids is thinking, are my children gonna be able to afford to live in the city that I love and that they love and maybe not? And so he said that that's, you know, that's something he wished he'd worked more on. Now, what does he see as the biggest challenges for the council and Mayor Kevin Faulkner, who's who's kind of entering his lame duck uh, stage right now, but going forward, uh, what, are, what are the big issues coming up? Housing, obviously. Is right, I mean, he said, you know, now that the Democrats on the council have the six to three veto-proof majority, they really need to figure out what it is that they want and have a leader who's going to get them to the place that they want to be on these issues. And he said in the interview that he would support uh, Georgia Gomez for council president. He thinks that she's the right person to pick out those issues that, that they should be leading on. All right, and uh, let's talk about uh, David Alvarez personally. Uh, we, we mentioned he, he didn't get the elective office <laughs> he was after. What's he gonna do now? Well, so he was supposed to run for county supervisor in two years. That was part of his plan that he would run for this community college board. Um, not serve out the full term and then run for county supervisor. And he said that he's kind of iffy on that. I feel like, you know, he partially, he just lost an election. So he's kind of sour about the whole process. Um, he said he's still thinking about it. He's still considering it. In the meantime, he has a plan. He said he's gonna open up a small business, he called it, but it sounded more like a consulting firm um, to work on border relations, improve the image of the border, um, things like that. And uh, it's too bad he just missed out on the big raise that the council members were all gonna get. He was <laughs> stuck on his entire eight years at 75 grand, which really doesn't seem like a whole lot for a job with yeah. that much time uh, and effort and responsibility. But if he ran for county supervisor, he'd get paid a little bit more. A lot more, and if he'd <laughs> still been on the council, his successor is going to be. Yeah. All right, one more question. We're almost out of time on this segment, but uh, does he ever plan to run for office again? I mean, you mentioned this, the, the county uh, soups and all here, but you wonder if after eight years, somebody just gets tired and let's do something else in life. I would bet that he will. I mean, I think he's a, a politician. That's like his, you know, that's what his background is. Um, so even if he doesn't run for county supervisor, I think we will probably be seeing more from him in the future. Get re that, that would be my guess, but. Re yeah, there's always state assembly. There's yeah. many other things to do, get recharged and. Uh, like I said, he knows, you know, he's very popular in his district. He knows how to reach people in his district. So I think he can put that to use in the future. Keep an eye on him going forward. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're gonna move on. Like a, a boat bobbing in a storm-tossed sea, San Diego's cruise ship industry has had its ups and downs. A decade ago, nearly a million passengers cruised in and out of San Diego. And then came the Great Recession, endless stories about violence in Mexico, and cruise ship traffic dried up. But now it's making a comeback. And Gore, uh, Lori, start there. Give us an idea how far this, this sector fell and uh, where we are right now. Right, it has been lots of ups and downs for this industry because if you go back um, more than a decade, it was, I mean, there was a point at which, I think it was around 2007, 2008, it was like in almost a million passengers were, were coming and it was very thriving. Um, and then, um, then there was the recession, which was a factor, but even more so um, the constant publicity surrounding violence in Mexico. And then there were a few incidents that were, where there were actually a couple of tourists targeted, um, robberies and so forth. So that made the cruise lines um, nervous. 
and soon you saw um, some of these cruise ships. There was one year-round ship, and then other cruise ships, Carnival, they left San Diego, and, and the cruise traffic plummeted. It is back on the upswing. It, it, at one point, it was as low as uh, about 183,000 passengers yeah. a year. So, that, I mean, that's down almost 80, 90 percent yeah, from yeah, its no, peak. It, it was, yeah, it was huge. Now, and, and again, you do have to credit the recession in part for that. Although cruise traffic um, globally yeah. has has been a, on a steady rise, recession aside, um, now they are back on the upswing. They're projecting for the coming year about over three hundred about three hundred forty thousand passengers, which is which is a big comeback from one hundred and eighty. And credit that Holland America has been the steady influence in San Diego. Um, they are continuing with about um, forty cruise calls a year. The season goes from October to May, so it's not year-round. Um, and then you've got Carnival is coming back for the first time in uh, uh, it's about seven, seven years. years. Yeah, seven years. Time, yeah. So they're, they're coming back. Um, and the thinking is that it won't be just a one-time deal. And then you've got Disney, which um, is very lucrative for San Diego. They, they have a lot of um, cruises now that they are, San Diego is a very regular stop for them in Mexico. Uh, and I think you're seeing that the cruise lines, I think, put some pressure on the ports themselves, Ensenada, um, Puerto Vallarta, um, to, to up their game, to, to do more security, to do better security, make them feel secure. Right, passengers. Acapulco was notorious for a while there, and they yeah, had to yeah, get you're some not, security. You're not seeing now. stops in Acapulco not seeing now. Stop. No, Even no. now, it's, no, it's really, uh -uh. Yeah. No, no, that still is an yeah. issue. Um, Mazatlan was a problem, but they do, they do stop in Mazatlan now. Um, and then um, the ports are sort of up their game. Ensenada did some improvements at their port. And they're also doing more enticing excursions, like in Ensenada, to the Valle de Guadalupe wine region, to craft breweries. So that's given the, the um, lines more confidence. But you do have to remember that these, they're always looking around the world for where's the next great kind of destination, whether it's Australia or the Mediterranean. So they, they, they are mobile, and they can change their itineraries at any it's Anytime. almost like they can sail anywhere. Yeah. Claire? Is there, <laughs> is there any sense that the stories about, you know, things happening at the border with tear gassing or whatever it is, does that have an impact, even though it obviously wouldn't actually impact people if it just, you know, influences people's thinking about it? I think they're probably a little more immune to it because, you know, they board a ship in San Diego and their next stop is Ensenada. They by, they bypass all that. Tijuana. And, and, and Tijuana, to, to your point, Tijuana's got a, a tremendous violence this year too, right? Yeah, the yeah. Murders. So, and that's a whole other issue that violent uh, the uh, Tijuana tourism declined recently. Yeah. But um, no, I think I think they're they're immune to that. And um, and and as I said, the cruise ship industry is on the rebound, even at a time when Mex violence in Mexico is still high. But obviously, the ports have done some things to satisfy these cruise lines and so they're they're comfortable still coming to San Diego and I should add that San Diego when you think of it when you compare it to the San Pedro report San Pedro port and Long Beach port in the LA area San Diego is you embark in San Diego and your gas lamp quarters right there the airports nearby I, I think zoo is nearby yeah, yeah all these tourist attractions downtown so I think the the cruise lines really like that as uh, the, the port of right, and we're not we're not L.A. with a big you know kind of daunting metropolis there. As you say, everything's close and it's it's uh, a quieter right. and, and easier, better experience. Now it's not just Mexico as a destination. There's other destinations that are popular for those cruising out of San Diego now, right? Yeah, you're seeing a lot of cruises to Hawaii. Of course, that's a lot of ocean cruising, but yeah, you're seeing a Hawaii Panama Canal. Um, there's a couple really long ones. One goes to Tahiti. So yeah, those and and then there's what they call the Pacific Coastal Cruise, where you stop some destinations along the coast, but always in Sonata. You can cruise up to Alaska, right? Is I think that might be a that's um, the summer uh, time, right? Yeah, that's when a turnaround. I think it's just maybe one that's, where they're turning around. Yeah, where the season mm -hmm. ends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Priya. Oh, no, I was just joking before that, you know, San Diego is such a big Navy town. And so, you know, oh, there yeah. are so many ships here, so many sailors here, so many people used to being on the water that I don't know if that could play a role in people not wanting to go on a cruise on their vacation. Because yeah, as a Navy kind person of, yourself, you're yeah, keen on cruises. Reminds you a little bit of work, so. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, um, they say that there's such a huge population for cruising that they haven't even taken advantage of that I don't think they have to worry about the large kind of military population or retiree. Mm -hmm. population because there is enough 
people outside of that demographic to satisfy the, the demand. Now, what about cruises overall? You mentioned they, they did still kind of held their own through the recession uh, generally, but is this still really popular for families and others? It, it seems like in a pretty affordable vacation to see a lot, eat a lot, maybe drink a lot, <laughs> yeah. and not have to unpack. And, and I think that's all, those are the advantage that people like. The, yeah, I think it's about 27 million passengers a year are cruising, and that's, um, um, that's and, it, and it has been, I, I mean, I saw the bar graph. It, it, there was no dips like in San Diego. It was a steady, steady ascent. So that it's, it's doing well. And there's, um, the ships are really upping their game. There's this one um, ship called the Region Bliss. It, it only, um, it stopped in San Diego recently. And um, they have um, like, a, like a, a car racing track on the top of the, on the top of the, one of the top decks. It's like a I mean, go kart thing. Yeah, like a, yeah, like that, like a go kart thing. And they, there's like. Um, I hope that floats when you shoot right yeah. off the deck. Yeah. So and they have these <clears throat> partnerships with whether it's the Oprah or with American America's Test Kitchen, or they have all these partnerships, and they just have all these additions, rock climbing and everything. That you so can there's imagine. no stories about millennials are killing the cruise industry the way millennials are killing. No. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and else. whatever else. That doesn't this. seem to be cereal. Like, <laughs> they get a decent young person's population on these short cruises, these short Mexican Riviera getaways. All right. Younger almost younger almost out of time. Impact San Diego cruise industry has here, just big ballpark dollar figure. They say that every cruise that stops here and people em embark on the cruise is about $2 million in sort of a ripple effect in economic impact and spending. So. All right. Keep them coming here. We'll see how that <laughs> goes if it keeps in, in, in increasing. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests. Lori Weisberg of the San Diego Union Tribune, Claire Tregesser of KPBS News, and Priya Shreether also of KPBS. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable. <music>